Good morning, California, and good afternoon and good evening, other parts of the world. Um, I would like to start by inviting uh, Professor Shirley Meng and Professor Martin Winter onto the stage to uh, kick off the seventh event of Storage X Symposium. In the past uh, a few months, you have been seeing uh, Storage X Symposium has been having amazing speakers to talk about energy storage. Uh, and this event is, is no difference. We now have uh, another two outstanding uh, battery scientists to come here to share with us about their work. Um, the two speakers, uh, Professor Shirley Meng, is a professor in the University of California, San Diego. Um, all of you know Shirley. Shirley has been one of the leading scientists in many aspects of the batteries. Um, she has been very active in developing new tools, new understanding to the very important battery problem. Uh, she is the winner of uh, many awards. I would like to just point out a few. She's the fellow of uh, Electrochemical Society, and she's also in the battery division playing a very important role right there. And as a very particular honor for me, I have been working with Shirley together in the Battery 500 Consortium. And recently, I want to say uh, congratulations to Shirley. Uh, she's a key team member. I saw the news winning the uh, National Science Foundation uh, New Research Center Award right there. There's uh, quite a number of dollars associated with that to support the research at UC San Diego. Our second speaker, Martin Winter, he's a professor at the University of Munster. Well, Martin, of course, has been a long time leader in the battery field. If you look into his CV, I, I would say he's, he has won probably all the awards possible in Electrochemical Society and also in the International Society of Electrochemistry. He's truly a leader, not only scientifically, but also he's leading the effort in Germany and in European unions and developing the batteries for EV. And he has uh, many titles right there I will not repeat. It is uh, my great honor today to have both of you to come to the stage to share with us about your very exciting research. Let's start from Shirley, please, Shirley. Thank you, Yi. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, I wanted to also take this opportunity to thank Stanford University for providing this uh, wonderful platform for us to exchange uh, ideas during this uh, extraordinary time. Uh, so let me get started uh, uh, on the major content of my talk. Um, so I believe in the audience, for this audience, most of the people are very familiar with the lithium ion battery technology. Uh, we are very lucky that uh, uh, last year, Professor Whittingham, Professor Goodenough, and uh, Dr. Yoshino uh, won the 2019 Nobel Prize uh, for chemistry. So the intercalation chemistry uh, has worked extremely well uh, in the last few decades. Uh, so I won't repeat the fundamentals of the uh, lithium-ion batteries, but just want to point out that uh, to increase energy density has uh, been uh, the forever pursuit of our field. Uh, and uh, there's three major things. I think the voltage is mostly governed by thermodynamics. Uh, we uh, know the Nernst equation, uh, where the um, chemical potential of the lithium in the cathode and the anode materials, the differences gave uh, the voltage. And I want to remind everyone in the Nernst equation, the number of electrons that the transferred per iron is actually on the denominator. And this is one of the reasons that um, many of the uh, multivalent cations tend to have low voltage, but alkaline metals like lithium, sodium, potassium uh, has the potential of uh, having relatively high voltage. 
So capacity is mostly governed by materials. Uh, when we have the uh, intercalation compounds, you can see the capacity is limited, but uh, uh, later you're going to hear about uh, using metallic lithium as the anode where we go away from intercalation chemistry. Uh, this is the time where the capacity can see a significant increase. Um, and I want to point out that uh, the electrolyte research has become uh, my latest passion because we do see quite a lot of uh, materials that can enable high voltage operation uh, based on thermodynamics. However, the limit on the electrolyte uh, has uh, uh, delayed our progress in terms of uh, enabling high voltage uh, uh, battery materials. So um, the major drivers, I would say, you know, one of the major drivers is really this holy grail quotation a lot of people use uh, that uh, to enable metallic lithium. Uh, in 1976, when Professor Stan Whittingham published 19, the uh, science paper, the metallic lithium was already used uh, in that work. Uh, and the generation zero of our rechargeable battery actually do use lithium metal. So 40, 50 years later, now that we are looking at this technology again, the major differences is well displayed by this graph where uh, we are going to use very, very limited lithium reservoir. Uh, sometimes you have seen in the field that people use it the so-called anode-free configuration because the cathode uh, NMC already have a lot of lithium content. However, the lithium metal research still is extremely important if we want to move towards lithium free cathode such as sulfur cathode. So I think the battery five consortium uh, has a very clear roadmap in terms of uh, uh, that our mission uh, to enable uh, lithium metal batteries uh, is very critical for the future of the battery field. And at the same time, again here, uh, that we have to enable higher voltage, wider voltage operation and longer cycle without the sacrifice safety uh, and the cost. So the electrolyte again become extremely important uh, enabler for the future battery technology. Um, so uh, let's take a close look at the electrolyte. So uh, of course, I highly recommend you read the Dr. Kang Xu's uh, uh, chemical review papers. This is where I learn most of the important knowledge on the uh, lithium iron organic electrolytes. Uh, so I want to point out that uh, the exploration of the electrolyte uh, also, uh, you know, many pioneers have worked in this field. Uh, the um, components in the battery, the salt, the solvent, uh, and uh, lithium PF6 is absolutely not the best choice. However, it does have a very well balanced properties compared to the other types of um, uh, salts. Of course, uh, I didn't put the lithium FSI and the lithium TFSI here. As many people know, these are the uh, salts that have been uh, catching a lot of attention lately. Um, the uh, progress of the uh, electrolyte discovery, you can see that uh, uh, it started all the way back to the 1960s, uh, where I think the PC propylene carbonate was explored. Uh, and uh, ethylene carbonate does not uh, uh, come into play until the late 80s. Uh, this is where uh, the first rechargeable battery uh, based on the graphite anode is used. Uh, however, uh, we have been, uh, you know, having different varieties of these uh, EC ethylene carbonate based electrolytes for quite some time. And uh, we are actually facing challenges to use the same electrolyte to enable lithium metal and especially to enable uh, low temperature performances. So I was very uh, fortunate uh, that uh, my uh, students and the postdocs and now the CEO of the startup company South 8, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Cyrus Rosmuji, uh, who came to me with a very, very interesting idea. So um, I think, uh, I assume everybody knows, but uh, I actually uh, have to say when, she, when he 
discussed with me why uh, gas molecules can be used as electrolyte. He made a very strong case where he showed the picture of the ethylene carbonate at room temperature is actually a solid compound. Uh, so the uh, once it's mixed with the linear carbonate, uh, you know, the liquid is the our version of commercial electrolyte. So when we think about electrolytes, uh, re, uh, you know, the reduction resistance, so you don't want electrolytes to be easily reduced and you don't want them to be easily oxidized. And EC actually uh, lies right there, if you can follow my cursor. Um, and uh, when we did the uh, computation exploration of the different solvent property, uh, Cyrus showed me nicely that uh, these gas molecules uh, actually has extremely high electron affinity and at the same time, very high ionization potential. So um, if you look at the ranking just based on the dielectric constant and the viscosity, uh, of course, some of these uh, gas molecules uh, doesn't look very uh, attractive. However, if you look at the ratio of the uh, uh, viscosity, uh, dielectric over uh, viscosity, these small molecules can assure very, very low viscosity, even at extremely low temperature. The only uh, differences between these gas molecules and uh, those organic uh, compounds like uh, acetylene carbonate, uh, diethylene carbonate, is that uh, you need to actually uh, confine them in the container where the pressure builds up. Once the pressure builds up, the self-equilibrium pressure will liquefy those gas. And that's the major idea behind a liquefied gas electrolyte. And we are also very fortunate that all those new salts, lithium TFSI, lithium FSI does dissolve uh, in those uh, electrolytes. So the first generation of these uh, liquefied electrolyte displayed some very astonishingly nice uh, physical and chemical properties for us uh, to use as a new generation of uh, electrolytes. So when we reported a couple of years ago, uh, we enabled the uh, lithium metal cycling. Uh, we demonstrated the minus 60 C degree Celsius uh, operation. Uh, I think I just want to say that uh, it was extremely exciting for us. However, we do realize there's still a lot of unresolved challenges uh, in the uh, uh, liquefied gas electrolyte. For instance, uh, the operation temperature is limited to 40 C because of the supercritical uh, phase transition for the gaseous phases. Uh, they actually, the salt will precipitate and the conductivity will drop. And perhaps one of the most uh, bothering factor for me is that uh, the solubility of the salt seems to only limit it to 0.1 or 0.2 molar. Uh, and we can enable the lithium cycling efficiency around 97.5%. Um, and uh, at the same time, uh, if we look at uh, uh, how lithium metal behaved in this liquefied gas electrolyte, we do see some encouraging uh, aspect. For instance, after very long cycling, we look at the current collector, the lithium metal doesn't display the kind of dendritic features like we always see in the carbonate-based electrolyte, even though the efficiency is low. Um, in order to enable very long cycling lithium metal anode, I think everybody understands that the efficiency has to rise uh, possibly to three nines. Uh, and this is an extremely difficult task, but I want to share with you today how we can actually uh, increase the lithium solubility and widen the operating voltage as well the temperature using some of the latest electrolyte design concept and the new computation and the characterization tools that enable us to understand better uh, those components uh, in the electrolyte. Therefore, we can actually progress towards uh, three nine uh, efficiencies for the. Um, so we actually, again, you know, the uh, lithium ion field uh, provided us some very exciting concept. Uh, I think everyone has 
uh, seen a couple of weeks ago, the talk on the electrolytes where uh, high concentration electrolytes or localized high concentration electrolyte are introduced. What's the difference between uh, those electrolytes is that, uh, of course, the con uh, in the first generation of the high concentration electrolyte, the increase of these uh, lithium salts uh, will introduce the, to this very highly viscous uh, electrolyte, but the, most of the lithium, uh, they are bound with the solvent molecules. So there's a very few free solvents flowing around. But one of the challenges to have this high concentration electrolyte is that the viscosity is so high that if we want to have this electrolyte penetrate to the porous cathode, we face some challenges. Uh, so later, many scientists, uh, uh, you know, Professor Yamada's group, uh, Pacific Northwestern National Lab, Dr. Kang Shu, they have introduced the diluent that uh, uh, still can enable locally very highly concentrated uh, uh, electrolytes with the lithium salts, and then the dilutant can actually help to reduce the viscosity. So we don't face this problem in terms of high concentration, but uh, uh, in the liquefied gas electrolyte, uh, very interestingly, we can borrow the concept and think about what kind of co-solvent we can actually utilize uh, to enable uh, the higher concentration of salt. So if we, one of the examples we showed is that uh, we can use the THF, which is miscible with the uh, fluoromethane, liquefied fluoromethane, and the percentage is actually very low. And because of that, we can increase the salt solubility by 10 times. Um, this, uh, uh, at the same time, improve the conductivity. So we collaborate with uh, Dr. Oleg Bordin, also in, from AMI Research Lab. Uh, he very nicely used the molecular dynamics uh, to demonstrate that because of this particular configuration, we have a very similar situation as the highly concentrated electrolyte in the liquid phase, where most of the TFSI will be uh, bonded and you have actually very good ionic uh, conductivity at the same time, very little free solvents uh, flowing around. And the transference number for this liquefied gas electrolyte has the lithium uh, transference number close to 0.8, which is uh, extremely high uh, among, the liquefied, uh, among the liquid form of electrolyte. Um, so I think some people know that uh, I'm a big fan, uh, like Professor Yi Tui, that a big fan using cryogenic techniques to probe uh, lithium metal, probe SEI. Uh, I think the uh, work has demonstrated that the cryogenic conditions is necessary for us to characterize uh, lithium metal. So what happened in this liquefied uh, gas electrolyte with um, uh, cycle the lithium. So I have three short movies to show you. The first one is in the regular carbonate electrolyte. And the second one will be in the um, ether based electrolyte where people are uh, awesome. Okay, so you can see the middle one is ether. The third one is actually in our liquefied gas electrolytes. Uh, this particular technique uh, with the uh, FEI uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific's um, dual being with the cryo stage can very nicely show us that uh, the uh, density of the lithium metal that has been uh, deposited. Uh, if you don't use a cryogenic technique, the data can be a little bit misleading because there's a lot of artifacts introduced by the Galleon ions. Uh, lithium and the Galleon does alloy at uh, room temperature. Uh, so this uh, we can help us to quantify. I think the quantification is the uh, nice part of these techniques where you can actually quantify the amount of uh, void surfaces. So uh, assuming, of course, there's some hypothesis in this analysis where we are assuming the less dense part uh, occupied by the uh, SEI or void, uh, you can see the dramatic reduction uh, in terms of the uh, porosities, uh, the ether-based electrolyte already way better than the uh, carbonate-based electrolyte. Uh, ether-based electrolyte typically produce those uh, granular 
lithium metal uh, crystals, the uh, liquefied gas electrolyte actually shows some very, very encouraging uh, morphology for the lithium metal, where you can see we are seeing less than 1% of the uh, porosity in the liquefied gas electrolyte. Um, so uh, another very uh, exciting uh, things that happened with this co-solvent idea uh, is that we are able to now enable very high critical current density without any special three-dimensional 3D current collector. This is on the flat uh, uh, stainless steel substrate. Uh, you can actually see a very good uh, high you know, the uh, over potential almost linearly scale with the current density increase. So I also want to take this opportunity to point out that uh, uh, getting to 3.9 is already difficult, but uh, having a potential stat that has 0.1% uh, uh, error bus is not a good sign. So I think that uh, moving forward, our field will need some help in the metrology development. Uh, we have this plus minus 0.3% uh, number variations. Uh, of course, you know, temperature control is important, but uh, I think as we progress towards very high efficiency lithium cycling, uh, we will also have to pay attention to the hardware. Uh, and the last not, but not least, uh, you know, uh, we are very uh, pleased to see the low temperature uh, uh, operation of the lithium metal batteries. Uh, this is the over potential and this is the current density and we show the different colors of the temperature. So in our lab, we can do minus 60 C very comfortably and you can uh, observe that, uh, of course, the over potential increased uh, very dramatically, uh, but uh, in principle, uh, it is possible uh, to have reasonable current, uh, critical current density uh, at even temperature as low as minus 60 C. Um, the second important uh, progress for the liquefied gas electrolyte is since you can use THF, we can also try other solvents. But our search is not uh, uh, just by trial and error. In fact, uh, in this particular case, my student uh, Dan Davis has been working with Dr. Boarding to look for other solvents. And uh, what they found is acetonitrile could be a very good co-solvent if we would like to widen the operating temperature of the liquefied gas electrolyte. So uh, in the most latest uh, uh, reports to the uh, open field, uh, we shown that uh, uh, with this new generation of the gas, liquefied gas electrolyte, the temperature operation temperature can be widened to a uh, much higher temperature above uh, 70 degrees Celsius and still maintain an extremely good uh, conductivity uh, that, uh, you know, this red curve here shows that uh, a very uh, good conductivity throughout a wide temperature range. Uh, from my perspective, when I actually look at, uh, you know, my student Yang Yang took the uh, minus 60 degrees Celsius deposit the lithium to the uh, cryo uh, fib, what we see is uh, a happy surprise. So here he was depositing 15 micrometer lithium, and we see the morphology of this lithium is extremely dense. Uh, I didn't show the room temperature one. The room temperature one looks even more beautiful. So um, with this uh, progress, I want to point out that uh, uh, you know this new class of electrolyte uh, exhibit uh, extremely exciting opportunity for us uh, to look at some of the new. Uh, electrode chemistry uh, away from intercalation, uh, particularly uh, for the uh, alkaline metal. Um, now I have shown you the low temperature. What about the high temperature? Since my talk is that saying that we have to go to the high temperature. So the exciting field, uh, I think uh, without saying people uh, you know, know that uh, the uh, solid uh, uh, electrolyte uh, is one of the strong contender for high temperature operation. So of course, these cells made in my lab, they are uh, still relatively low energy density. I think we made it in 2019. Uh, you know, the, <clears throat> the, the progress of the solid state uh, uh, electrolyte, uh, you know, we started uh, uh, about eight years ago, and we know at that time already our colleagues in Japan have already made a lot of progress in the past. Uh, you know, we are 
playing catch up. Um, and uh, the enabling major factor is that uh, we moved away from pellet the cells go to pot type of cells uh, where we can make a thin electrolyte, which I will mention later how uh, engineering wise, how that can be achieved. And there's a lot of uh, chemistry involved as well. Um, and uh, we also reported the, the importance of pressure control to enable lithium metal cycling. And right now we are in the stage to uh, lower the electrolyte amount in the thick electrode loading. And uh, the progress, uh, uh, you know, a couple months ago reported by Samsung uh, that showing that a very promising uh, future for the solid state batteries. And I do want to say that, uh, uh, you know, my perspective is that the solid state provides such a wonderful platform uh, for us to think about what kind of new uh, electrochemistry, new characterization science uh, we can do. And that's truly uh, exciting for us. So again, you know, for uh, electrolytes, uh, I show these pictures, just keep reminding people the homo lumo picture of the lithium ion uh, liquid cell. Uh, in the solid space, uh, polymer oxides and sulfides all have been explored. And one of the reasons the oxides was so popular is because it's uh, stability, right? So if you look at where the metallic lithium, silicon, graphite, and all the cathode where their potential, uh, you know, the voltage windows are, and then you think about uh, the uh, electrolyte uh, where the SEI, CEI are located, uh, it's kind of interesting the sulfide electrolyte can ever work because obviously it has neither reductive stability nor oxidative stability. And this has been demonstrated very well by both computational and uh, uh, experimental group. Uh, but this is where I think interfacial science and interfacial engineering really shine as uh, uh, almost like a magic where they can uh, enable uh, stable cyclings uh, because we truly understand that the uh, sulfide stability is very limited. So instead of fighting it, we could think about how we can actually utilize those unique properties uh, of the sulfides. Um, so uh, with that, I think, uh, you know, uh, the topic is very broad. So today I can only mention a couple of very brief examples, uh, but I want to uh, emphasize that uh, uh, my take on the interfacial science in solid state batteries is it is indeed way more complicated than the liquefied, than, uh, sorry, than the liquid electrolytes. Uh, so one of the major reasons uh, we did this review in chemical reviews is that uh, we want to really point out that uh, in the solid state electrolyte, uh, if we want any reasonably cast uh, uh, electrolytes that, you know, they are integrated with the cathode, uh, I think having void is inevitable. Uh, also, you know, the cathode is still, we still stay with the intercalation compound. So those cathodes do have volume changes, right? So once the void gets generated, if there's a minor volume change in the solid state, and we have more numbers of interface. Uh, and uh, if we have those interface in the solid state batteries, same with the liquid type, you really have to think about both chemical stability, because the cell is going to sit there next to the sulfide electrolyte, as well as electrochemistry, because you're going to sweep the voltage. So the reactivity of the cathode is going to change because you extract the lithium. So those uh, complexity uh, make our research on the solid state battery extremely challenging and interesting. So, um, you know, coding is one of the best strategies for us to tackle the uh, cathode stability. Uh, and I will give uh, short examples. And uh, I want to emphasize here that my colleague, Professor Xue Bing On, has been working with us for many years. And uh, we have many candidates for the coating uh, materials. And I think uh, lithium iobates is not uh, uh, the only one that can work. So first, let me talk about the anode side of the interfacial uh, 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 
uh, story. So uh, on the negative electrode side, for a very long time, we have trouble enable lithium metal cycling. Uh, I think uh, most of people know in the early days of solid state, we do very strong pressing. I mean, this kind of pressure, you know, people keep telling me is impractical, not practical for real cells. Uh, but we do need to, when we fabricate these, because they are all solid state, so we need a very high pressure to establish the contact because otherwise the cell impedance is just skyrocketing. So you need a very high, uh, during the fabrication, high pressure. But when we cycle the battery, I think, uh, you know, the students, uh, uh, Han, who did this work, uh, uh, very nicely demonstrated that uh, you need to release the stress, like let it go when you are cycling it. And uh, five megapascal is the critical uh, pressure uh, uh, level you can do lower i think we uh, realize you know there's a lot of people in the field working on the mechanical property of the lithium metal so below five megapascal uh, the cells can cycle quite well uh, even though the critical current density is still uh, relatively low i think our cells now reached almost a thousand cycles uh, and uh, i think these are the things that we feel the solid state uh, uh, batteries uh, uh, provided a platform for us to learn some new science because here obviously the mechanical properties of the materials come to a critical play and uh, using pressure as a control knob uh, you know we have not been doing that uh, uh, enough okay so for the cathode example very quickly i want to point out uh, uh, there's a chemical stability because when you make NCA or NMC next to the sulfide, you put the oxide next to a sulfide, there will be reactions, right? So that's what we call the chemical stability. What's the electrochemical stability? Because when you sweep the voltage, you take lithium out, the reactivity of those NMC and NCA will change. So if you want to have a stable coating, the coating has to be stable when the electrochemical status of the cathode change. So based on both experiment and the computation we did with Professor Shripping Ong's group, we can demonstrate very nicely that the coatings that can, uh, they can actually significantly improve. You know, if you coat the NCA with the niobates, you can actually stabilize the uh, cathode. And uh, I want to stress here, you know, again, not, lithium niobates is not the only uh, uh, cathode that can cycle. So the coatings, uh, I think, uh, you know, well, I'm running short of time. I just want to show that uh, uh, if it's coated uh, very effectively, very thin coating is needed, five to 10 nanometer, and you can have very prolonged cycling for the uh, cathode materials. So um, that uh, brings me to the message, you know, with these two short examples, I think uh, in the lithium ion cells, I was very fortunate in the last 10 years working together with uh, Professor Stan Whittingham, Claire Gray, uh, many pioneers in the field. We built this very nice platform from atomic level to electrode level where the interface and the uh, structure, chemistry, everything is properly uh, characterized. And that's where enable us you know, go from the two nines to three nines uh, in the NMC or NCA type of uh, uh, cathode materials and uh, liquid electrolyte. Now with the solid state, uh, I think the interface really presents some big challenges and we have to think about out new tools, we have to actually push the boundaries. Uh, the buried interface is the very, very difficult thing to enable uh, true uh, operando characterization uh, because most of these solid state uh, uh, cells, they uh, contains all solid. You cannot really evaporate the electrolytes. So the electrolyte is part of the characterization. But those electrolytes, they are extremely electronically insulating. They are ionically conductive, but they are extremely electronically uh, insulating. So if we want, we want to use the X-ray and the electron-based uh, characterization techniques, uh, we are facing some challenge. Of course, in the field, uh, uh, you know, both the, um, uh, I think Professor Jürgen Janik has done, done very nice work on the in-situ XPS. And I think uh, you are going to see 
in more NMR-based and uh, CT-based uh, techniques uh, to actually um, discover what is the dynamic nature in this solid-to-solid uh, uh, -solid interface. And the challenge is really that uh, uh, you know, we have to uh, keep pushing the boundaries so that we can have a better understanding of the interface. So I'm all, almost coming to the end of my uh, presentation. I think this one is uh, pretty uh, interesting now with the sulfide solid electrolyte, very nice uh, solvent has been found. You need to use, uh, you know, uh, nonpolar solvent uh, where you can actually make these uh, very nice uh, dispersed um, uh, solutions where uh, the solid electrolyte can be a potential drop in solution in the current processing line. And uh, my colleague, Professor Zhen Chen, have helped me a lot in finding out what is the best uh, 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 solvent to use. So to conclude the solid state part, uh, I think that uh, the solid electrolyte, uh, uh, you know, next couple of years, we're gonna see very exciting progress, both academically and also in the industry side. Uh, I think I hope uh, that uh, showed you that, uh, uh, you know, the Characterization is a very important part. Now, if we want to move to the three nine efficiencies, we need a very sensitive, quantifiable tools to uh, study those electrolyte and uh, scalability now become in, come into question. And uh, I do think that, uh, uh, you know, this part we will work very closely with our industry partner. Uh, last but not least, uh, uh, I want to also take the opportunity to say both the liquefied gas electrolyte as well as the solid state uh, electrolyte, at least in my research group in our uh, campus, uh, we highly, highly paying attention to the recycler ability. Anybody who does the new battery chemistry, uh, we must think sustainability, uh, take sustainability very, very seriously because uh, we will imagine a world that uh, uh, there will be terawatt of uh, terawatt hour of batteries being built. So with that, thank you very much. Uh, um, I think it's my great honor to work with my colleagues um, who are really uh, extremely collaborative uh, and all the industry uh, partners that have uh, enabled uh, uh, those research. So the liquefied gas electrolyte was uh, supported by ARPA-E because it's such a crazy idea. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, we have very good partners uh, with uh, LG Chem and Shell. Uh, I'm very grateful for the support. And uh, for lithium metal batteries, uh, we continue, uh, like he said, with the Battery 500 Consortium, continue to push the boundaries. Uh, and for all the uh, uh, characterization tools, uh, the basic energy science uh, provided the huge support to enable my group to do a lot of the uh, microscopy work. With that, thank you very much. Okay, Shirley, great talk. You know, um, you presented to us two different types of exciting electrolyte. What, what's the opportunity and also challenges right there? There are tons of questions, very interesting one piling up for you. <laughs> I, I'm glad to see that. So let's start from your uh, liquefy. Uh, gas electrolyte. Uh, the first question is related to low temperature and uh, high temperature. When you change the temperature, this plating uh, morphology can change. So how do you explain this uh, uh, morphology change of lithium plating at low and high temperature? They are different? Uh, actually, in our um, uh, liquefied gas electrolyte, uh, the difference we're showing is between the different electrolytes. Mm -hmm. in, in fact, in the liquefied gas electrolyte, we always get a very dense lithium. There's no difference between low temperature oh, and low okay. temperature. But between different electrolytes, I think uh, uh, this is the part, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think you know that uh, in Many work we do now is look at the, the nucleation of lithium metal. Oh. And uh, the field is facing a lot of the difficulties because operandal nucleation for lithium metal uh, is still not enabled, right? We, we always deposit the lithium and then we put the microscope to look. Mm -hmm. 
So I think in order to truly answer the question, I mean, there's a lot of hypotheses, of course. So in the liquefied gas electrolyte, please remember we don't have long carbon chain so we only have small molecules therefore the SEI component are fundamentally different from the carbonate and the ether based electrolyte uh, so this could be one of the major contributing factors that certain components mm -hmm. for the SEI is missing in the liquefied gas electrolyte and that caused the morphology difference yeah, so uh, surely speaking of that, the SCI, these, your liquefied uh, electrolyte, have you looked at this carefully and the cryo-EM, uh, what's the difference between your SCI and the liquefied electrolyte, electrolyte compared with carbonate or either? Did you see big difference? Uh, yeah, so uh, one of the biggest uh, difference is actually we don't have any LQ lithium. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Because, uh, our molecule is CF based, yeah. so uh, there is really no uh, certain those elements are not present. But I I think with cryo EM, you know, we cannot see those uh, alkylate right. anyway. Yeah. So yeah, I think that uh, this gave us the very good question: if this is the ultimate culprit, because uh, uh, we don't know. Nobody has actually shown how exactly LQ lithium look like. Yeah, because you have this uh, fluorinated methane, do you see more lithium fluoride in the SCI? Oh. Uh, yeah, so I think that uh, uh, there's definitely a lot more lithium fluoride uh, compared to the uh, traditional low concentration carbonate electrolytes. Uh, do we do see most of our SEI component, uh, they are consist of the uh, lithium oxide and the lithium fluoride. Uh, I think the part that we still need to work more on it is because in our early version of electrolyte, the carbon dioxide is being used as an additive. Uh, so yeah. to make the, you know, uh, carbonate is becoming a, it's definitely there, lithium carbonate. Mm -hmm. But we don't know it's the chemical reaction or it's actually electrochemical formed SEI. Okay, yeah. So next question, Shirley. Uh, what's the rationale and uh, when you choose this coal <coughs> solvent? Um, and what's the guiding principle right there for this uh, liquefied uh, electrolyte? Maybe I can be more uh, in, in detail. Some of the thought in my mind is you have talked about THF, right? You have been talking about uh, also acetone nitride. Yeah. Uh, certainly THF, acetone nitride, uh, these, I mean, to me, when I look at that, I say, well, it's a, uh, this solvent along, it's a cathode uh, stability uh, is not very good. But in the liquefied electrolyte condition, it might be different. Can you make a comment about the principle? And I know it's wide parameter window, windows right there. <laughs> Give you a... <laughs> Yeah, so for THF and acetone nitrile, we decided to release to the public uh, because, uh, of course, the Cyrus in South Aid has ma many more magic formulations. But the THF and the acetone nitrile are good learning examples. So if you think about electro affinity, which is the reduction resistance and the oxidative resistance. So acetone nitrile is bad for reduction, but good for uh, oxidation resistance. So acetone nitride actually is not bad for the resistance for oxidation, but it's very poor for the, uh, uh, but I think when you actually just put a small amount, think about uh, the, the function of THF and acetone nitride is going to bind the lithium salt. So they're not playing as the major solvent. So the solvent, major solvent goal is still played by the uh, FM. And, and I think in a couple of months, we will release the data on the uh, DFM as well. Um, and uh, those solvents, uh, because of the, in the highly concentrated electrolyte, if you remember, some of the ether, they can go high voltage because mm -hmm. of the concentration. So we basically borrowing the similar concept where uh, we have each of the solvents play its own role. So the acetone nitrile, even though the reduction potential, reduction resistance is not good, but we found if you only add a very small control amount, its main job is to bind the uh, salt, not to um, participate in the electrochemical activity. Yeah. 
So I guess your, your answer to this question also partially answer another question. So saying, you know, we so THF right there, THF must be solvated partially with lithium ion and how to explain the uh, columbic efficiency improvement. I, I think you kind of also related to these questions. So let me move on to the uh, next question. Uh, there's a person asking this, I think it's kind of interesting. Uh, it's because it's fluorinated. <laughs> Uh, methane. Yeah. Uh, is that a concern? You know, this can be the, uh, uh, you know, global warming gas, right? Kind of, you know, greenhouse gas, why right? is that a concern in using? Yeah, very uh, yeah. good question. So uh, if you, people go back to our 2017 publication, we have been very transparent upfront. We actually gave all greenhouse gas index numbers to the fluorinated gas species when we first published. And uh, uh, yeah, so compared to the chlorinated version, we are better, right? Because you know that uh, the, the, the fluorinated version is way better than the chlorinated version, but we are still not uh, innocent. Okay, so that's actually one of the major drivers for me to figure out the recycling of the electrolyte 100%. And I tell mm -hmm. people it's looking good because yeah. it's gas species. So uh, yeah, the refrigerator <laughs> industry has figured it out and I'm sure we will figure it out. And uh, it also uh, encourage us to really think about uh, we need to recycle it 100%. Okay. So let's uh, be uh, uh, you know, five more minutes. Let's move on to the asking the question related to uh, surely related to your solid electrolyte work. Uh, this one question asking, um, can you comment on optimizing the cell pressure between good interface contact? And then you also need to consider short circuiting and solid state batteries. What are the ma major factors that could contribute to this? So you know, good interface versus the shorting, any comment on the pressure effect? Yeah. Right, so right now I believe that uh, one, a couple of megapascal is the optimum pressure that we have, uh, you know, we are happy to share with the field. Uh, I do believe that uh, uh, one or two megapascal is not practical. So I participated in some workshop uh, where the OEMs are there. They told me, you know, one atmosphere is 100 kilopascal. Surely you want a 10 times more than that. You know, it's really kind of a, a, a bottleneck. Uh, in, and, and by the way, there's a difference between uniaxial pressure, we call it a stack pressure, and also uh, Samsung reported this uh, warm isostatic pressure. Isostatic pressure is uh, mm -hmm. something, you know, uh, very, very costly to achieve. Uh, so uh, I, think the answer is still, I don't have an answer. I would say the lithium metal for the uh, solid state, if we can't figure out uh, the pressure knob, we will still be uh, relatively stuck in terms of the actual commercialization. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, you know, you also did a lot of the host, uh, host method for lithium metal. Mm -hmm. right? So one of the ways to think about how you can mitigate the pressure challenge is to think about how porous materials can change the pressure distribution. Uh, I think that could be a potential direction to go, uh, but uh, I don't have a clear answer uh, if one mega, mega Pascal is a possibility. And then the, during the processing, uh, I think that uh, people can use temperature to replace the pressure need. But uh, during the cell operation, right now, I don't have a better method than going to one or two megapascal. Yeah, uh, one more question, Shirley. Um, there's an audience asking you about, uh, since sulfide-based solid electrolyte has smaller potential window stability, do you think it is still strong content, content, uh, contenders compared to oxide mm -hmm. solid electrolyte? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, what I shown uh, in uh, my talk, uh, the sulfides, uh, uh, the oxidative uh, stability is, no, if you just use LPS with the oxide, 
it barely works, right? So then chlorine doping changed, right? So, I mean, we think about uh, the phase space there, right? So this is the part I want to highly recommend the computational method. It's really, really very helpful for the screening of solid electrolyte. So I think sulfides, uh, you know, um, the dopant goes into the sulfide electrolyte. Sulfides are so friendly to any foreign elements. So when they come in, it will take it and that will change its stability. So when we think about the coating, right? You think about the coating is change on the cathode. So turn your mind around to think about how those coating, you know, can you actually dope the solid electrolyte to change its chemical reactivity? Uh, I think that mm -hmm. oxide is definitely strong, uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, I used to joke about, you know, I put a high school student making the sulfides bombing, very easy. But if LLZO, I have to put a PhD students in order to obtain very, very brilliant properties. So I think that's the part where, uh, you know, um, sulfides for me uh, is uh, more preferred because I want a materials that can be easily synthesized and that can be sc easily scaled, scaled to mm -hmm. really large uh, quantity without much uh, difficulties. Um, I see uh, between two of you, or I, I want to ask one question. Surely you talk about ceramic electrolyte interface and so on. I'm so glad Martin talked about polymer electrolyte, solid polymer electrolyte. I really like that as well. I also work on that quite a bit. So uh, then one question is for solid state battery, polymer, ceramic, whether it's oxide, sulfide, you know, looking at this whole grand scheme, do you have, want to make comments, you know, which one you think might be more promising and why? We all understand they have this advantage and advantages and disadvantages. I want you to kind of, in the final panel right here, giving your, your will, you're taking a minute for each of you to, to express your will. Maybe Shirley, you want to go first? Give me Martin a break. <laughs> sure, yeah, I think that for lithium metal anode uh, polymer still remains an extremely promising approach. Uh, the cell architecture might require polymer plus ceramics, but which ceramics, I think that's a, a question I cannot answer yet, uh, but I do believe that uh, the hybrid approach will be necessary if we want to engineer a cell that uh, lasts very, very long, as well as extremely safe. Well, I, think. I, think, I think we cannot ignore hybrid electrolytes. It's an underexplored opportunity of these new um, materials. Um, we also should, think in layers. Um, if we come to, let's say, layered electrodes, uh, we can use multi-layer approaches where one electrolyte is in contact with the one electrode and the other electrolyte part is in the contact with the second electrode. Um, if we go away from layered approaches um, that we are, for example, using both um, composite electrodes on the anode and cathode sides, just remember your talk, E, from last week, where you were looking at carbon nanomaterials, hollow carbon nanomaterials. Um, the interface can not only, the, let's say, the homogeneous interface between lithium and electrolyte, or between cathode and electrolyte, cannot be only electrolyte. It can be also an electrode material. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. And uh, my next question is uh, even bigger scale. <laughs> uh, Martin, you mentioned about European uh, Union's effort and Germany's effort, how to organize the, uh, the batteries, activity forming centers, you know, this uh, uh, called uh, battery 2030 beyond, right? And US right here, you know, Shirley and I participate in Battery Foundry Consortium. There is also Battery Hub, there's CESAR, this EFRC. If you look at Japan, you look at China, all have their own and career, their own program. So anything, two of you, you know, you can see you say, yeah, from the past about five years or in a decade long lessons learned. Um, and what type of investment still needed, you know, 
and how do we organize the, the, the benefits community, to, um, community together to address the opportunity of EV, the challenges of EV, as well as Grayscale and, and, and many others. Any thoughts to share with uh, the audience? I'm sure there's many industry folks right here and including the perspective, how do we engage industry? And there could be government officials right here listening to this talk right now. Anything you want to say to, to, to really share your thought about this? Well, this one, Martin has to go first. <laughs> Martin. Thank, you. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you. So if you look at the German situation, I have to say that in batteries in Germany, there is a push-pull, let's say, uh, motivation. The industry is pulling us to find the super battery because present lithium ion is, let's say, not enough, especially when it comes to fast charging and uh, driving range at the same time. I'm not sure whether lithium metal and solid electrolyte, especially lithium metal in foil form, will help us with fast charging, by the way. Um, the Academic part in Germany is, I'd say, we have a strong materials part. We also have a lot of activity on non-lithium chemistries. Um, we also have, and I think this is maybe a little bit different to the situation in other um, continents and other countries. We have a very strong engineering in Germany. We have big production research departments. So if you consider that, for example, Münster is a big research group with about 220, 230 people, this is nothing compared to the engineering departments in Aachen, where you have 600, 700 people working on various, let's say, propulsion systems, including fuel cell and batteries. And um, at the moment, it's very difficult to not only to bring these people together, I think it's not so difficult because there's so much big money and we should work together. That is one of the preconditions of the ministry. So, of course, we cooperate when uh, the money is um, uh, waving us at, at us uh, at the, <laughs> the horizon. But um, do we speak the same language? Do, we, do the engineers expect something from us which we can, are able to deliver? Honestly, in the 2008, 2009 year, a lot of the automotive engineers, especially the electrochemical part, especially the electrochemical part, the surface chemistry, they are not aware of. And, um, then there is the other thing, if I can expand on this, that chemists, except for the physical chemists, usually we like to work in a qualitative, let's say, uh, added, we like to work in a, on a, in a qualitative manner. So we are saying something is better than the reference, for example. But engineers want to have absolute numbers from us. And um, this is something which we have to learn. So if you say, what is uh, the challenge? The challenge is, that the interface between material science and all the engineering, when you go to production research and also to the applications, that this interface is not a sharp interface, a smooth interface, but it's an integrated interface where the people are working closely to each other. We need the people on the engineering side who have interest and understanding in material science and the other way around. So I will mention about uh, uh, the uh, actually, what the question is really nice. Thank you, Yi. Um, you know, the, there's really four points I want to say. The first thing is uh, for all the scientists around the world. I really think that uh, international cooperation and collaboration are so important. So uh, I hope that, uh, you know, despite the COVID-19, the borders uh, are closed, but our, you know, like the fact that you're doing this uh, platform really encourages us to exchange ideas and, uh, you know, um, our thoughts. Uh, so I want to emphasize on this thing about the data reporting among the scientists. Uh, yeah, I think uh, there will there are calls among many consortiums that when we need to be transparent and be doing the best practice when we are reporting the data. So nothing confidential, it's just uh, uh, you know, the fact that we need to disclose the information about the data. I, I hope uh, more and more scientists will join this effort in terms of what's the best way of reporting data. Like one thing for sure, please report the amount of electrolytes in your <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, the second point I want to point out for our industry colleague is that uh, for me, I think Martin brought up a such a good point. Uh, actually, our product, my product, are my students. 
they are the people who are going to go to industry to make a difference. So uh, the fact that, you know, engineers and material scientists, I think it's because many companies don't have material scientists or electrochemists as part of the team members. And I, I hope we're in coming years, we're going to see the huge changes because uh, uh, for academic institutions, uh, yes, IP and the publications and uh, things are uh, important, but uh, for me, the human capital is the best asset we are going to uh, provide for the industry. And uh, uh, as the Martin probably know in uh, Germany, I don't know, but in US, so many engineering schools stopped the teaching uh, electrochemistry. Uh, there's no dedicated course, right? So I think uh, hopefully many uh, academic institutions uh, uh, with the support from government and uh, industry, we will be able to do more of that. I mean, think about the microelectronics industry, you know, how many people they've educated to actually being able to do those large scale fab. And we will have to equip the, all the gigawatt factories with our top scientists, material scientists and electrochemists and engineers. I think the third point is really towards the fundamental science. I know Stan is listening. Uh, Professor Stan Whittingham was one of the pioneers in the battery research field. And he always, always emphasized how important it is to invest in fundamental science. I mean, interfacial science, Martin, I mean, the, the, the interface picture we shown, I mean, the work was done 40, 50 years ago, and they are truths. They are valuable, so valuable. But they, when these people did those interfacial science, they didn't know today there will be this uh, mega dollar industry, right? So I think that uh, uh, basic research is extremely important and there will be more um, investment made in terms of fundamental science, uh, fundamental electrochemistry. Last but not least, I think investment, we talk about the big dollars. Uh, actually, in my opinion, uh, with the scale of the climate change problems, our investment is way under, way, way under. I mean, con consider the cancer problems and the health problems the uh, you know, people are facing. And then you think about the scale of the climate change. I mean, I have seen the values of investment coming from private sectors, particularly in the philanthropy and, uh, uh, you know, individual uh, donors, the, 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 the contributions for us to do STEM field, you know, solutions to provide for climate change. Uh, climate crisis is actually very, very little. So I think all of us have to do better in terms of, I mean, Stanford is our leading examples, but uh, in many other places, uh, I think we need to do more. So. Thank you so much, Shirley. This is very well said. I highly appreciate both of you. I can see the time is up. I can see three of us and with more people, we can go into a even more an exciting discussion. We will find a time when we meet in person, right? Having a drink. Maybe we can organize a Zoom drink, drink sometime. So, so with that, I think today's uh, a session is uh, well concluded. Thank you to both of you for the fantastic talk. So at the end, uh, Justin, can you bring up the holding slide? Um, we will continue this exciting uh, series of uh, symposium. Next week, we will have uh, Professor Mantheram from UT Austin, as well as our own Professor William Chair from Stanford University to, to speak. I look forward to seeing you uh, next week at uh, the same time. Thank you so much. Bye now. Thank you. Well done. Thank you, Yi. Well Thank you, Martin. Yeah.